So we're going to talk about a little bit about two of the technologies we'll be using this week, um, HydroShare and JupyterHub. Um, and I do want to introduce a few people that um, are, are going to help out with the, the presentation, but also are kind of your go-to people if you have questions about either of these technologies. Um, this is myself, I'm Tony Castronova. Um, I'm a hydrologist at Quasi, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, of course, Christina Banderagoda at University of Washington, John Pollock, um, also at Quasi, and Scott Black at USU. Um, and um, actually, well, I'm gonna go ahead and give everyone an opportunity just to introduce themselves real quickly. So Christina, do you wanna give a, a quick um, introduction to yourself? Sure. Um, I am Christina Bandaragoda. My background is in hydrology. Um, in my PhD, I studied distributed hydrologic modeling. And what I thought I was going to eventually study, or I originally wanted to be a doctor, right? And then I realized so many health issues are connected to water that I wanted to get into that field, which led me into getting understanding and needing to build up my informatics skills and the software that's required to scale across, you know, the climate change impacts and through streams that may be polluted to understand the health impacts is what is my interest. Thanks. Um, John. Hey everybody, uh, I'm John Pollock. I'm a uh, program manager at Quasi. I'm a geographer by training, so a lot of my kind of personal interests are related to things changing over space and time, uh, especially related to climate change vulnerability. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, supporting this event and helping you guys out, especially when using uh, HydroShare. Scott. I'm Scott Black. Uh, I work at Utah Water Research Laboratory at Utah, at Utah State Uni University. I'm a programmer. Um, I mainly work on HydroShare. Um, in the past, I've worked in uh, big data systems with recommendation systems and like population ratings uh, using Hadoop. Um, so if you've got questions with Python, HydroShare, um, integration with Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub, I'm happy to help out. Great, uh, thanks guys. And, and I'm Tony Castronova, hydrologist at Quasi. Um, the one thing I didn't mention is um, I've been working on the HydroShare project for a handful of years now. Um, and I also am the primary developer maintainer of Quasi's instance of Jupyter Hub, the one that we'll be playing around with today. So feel free to ask me any questions on anything uh, regarding those. So I'm gonna pass off to um, John here to give us an introduction to Quasi. He's our um, longest employee or oldest, I don't know what it is. He's been at Quasi the longest right now. Um, and he will probably do a better intro than I did earlier today. So go ahead, John. Great, thanks, Tony. Uh, so Christina mentioned a little bit about Quasi or Tony might have uh, earlier about our acronym. Uh, so it's the Consortium of University for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. The H before S uh, confuses folks a lot, um, but uh, we're we're here to really support uh, the the water science community, um, both around the research, um, but also education as well. So we're really here to, um, you know, empower the community with tools that aren't provided by tools and services that aren't provided anywhere else. So whether that's uh, you know grant grant programs that are a little bit too small for NSF or an agency to manage, or if it's, you know, specialized hands-on training, um, we provide kind of a full suite, full portfolio of services that uh, really, you know, we hope and, you know, kind of the in past experience has really helped, uh, like I said, both re researchers and educators uh, progress their career. Um, so we really focus kind of starting graduate students on up. Um, that's actually changing now where we're making more of an effort uh, to engage undergraduate education as well. But, um, I think as, as described earlier, our, our, our program services really fall under um, two categories, community services. Uh, so those are a lot of communications, our jobs board, uh, 
research, uh, our listing of graduate programs, the hands-on training, fellowships, grant programs, things like that. Um, but also in addition to that, we provide some really more um, technology-based uh, tools and services, or data services, and that's really all around enabling access to data sets, uh, helping folks fulfill their data management plans, as well as to share um, you know, share data so you can get credit um, in, um, in terms of, you know, publication of manuscripts and, and including the data, data sets and models as well. Um, so, yeah, so I've been at Quasi for about eight years, so I have a pretty good understanding of the organization and community, I hope. So I'm happy, you know, uh, ping me on Slack or shoot me an email if you have any questions. And um, like I said, I'm looking forward to uh, supporting you guys throughout this event. Uh, th thanks, John. Um, that was great. Uh, just to give everyone an idea of where we're going with this presentation, um, the two technologies, the icons at the bottom, HydraShare and JupyterHub, that's really what we're going to be covering today. There are two things that um, we want every participant to understand. We want them to understand what the purpose of each of them is and how they can use them um, to support their their research during this week, but then also um, how it may apply to work that you do after um, Water Hack Week uh, ends. One thing to clarify, or one thing to mention, is that HydroShare is an NSF-funded project. It's been, I think it started, I don't know, was it eight years ago maybe now? Maybe almost closer to 10. Um, and this is a data repository for uh, what we call domain-specific data, so uh, water, uh, water science data. Um, and Christina's gonna talk a little bit about this, just give us a really great overview of the, the purpose and some of the key features of HydroShare. And then Jupyter Hub, which may maybe many of you are familiar with Jupyter already. Jupyter Notebooks are it's Jupyter is an open source project. Um, they there's a software called Jupyter Hub that allows you to run these notebooks in the cloud. Um, and what we'll be talking about specifically is an instance of this open source software that Quasi maintains for um, the water science community for general access or general um, general research, but also education. Um, so it's not something that we are, we are not the developers of Jupyter, Jupyter Hub. We are a user of it and we have our own implementation for the water science community. So um, with that, I'm gonna move on and Christina's gonna take over here. Um, let me see if I can advance the slides. Christina, are you ready? So she's probably trying to find the screen. So <laughs> well, while she does that, um, anyone that does not have a HydroShare account and wants to follow along, um, and I guess one thing I should say about this is the presentation is supposed, or we're hoping it'll give a great or a good overview of those two technologies or two software, software, and we'll go through a demo. Um, and looks like Christina's sharing the screen. Go through a demo um, and then have some time for everyone to work on their own to explore how, how to use technologies. Um, so the one slide I had before we switched screens was um, going to hydroshare.org and signing up. If you have not done so already, you'll, give it, you'll be given an email um, that you have to validate with and, um, and then your account will be valid. So Christina, go ahead. Thanks. Um, if I mute or unmute, let me know. And can I also just check? We are going to be on the help desk Slack channel for this tutorial because that's where I just share questions from here on out, especially John um, is going to be like on point to help with those. Um, and then also we have a Jupyter Hub Slack channel. Um, but for today, we'll just keep everything on the help desk if it's for for help for today, um, just to get us used to the help desk. So what I'm gonna start with is the context or like a case study that we um, put together. So before I go into HydroShare, um, what I wanted to call out is a project that is a case study that might be similar to something you might work on if you are just are you if you're new to github if you're new to data science you're new to publishing your data and putting it online but you have been told to like make your data fair or if you've heard of you know or if your journal wants you to publish your data online um, one 
example is an outcome of that was a project that I put together with um, colleagues, including Jezra, who is maybe here. I'm kind of putting her on the spot. She, she is a participant. Um, but, and it's a, an example of working with these technologies with the outcome being to publish your data. So, you know, what I'd like to have everyone keep in mind this week is and as an endpoint, we want this to make your, your research more efficient. Part of that is making your data, um, making it easier for you to publish your data, but also making it easier for people to use your data because all of the information that anyone would need is <clears throat> available. So just as a, keeping the end in mind, I wanted to start with an example that is a publication. Uh, so Data Embrace is a journal that publishes data and the description of the paper, and, and the paper is very, um, much just focused on a description of the data. And what we did um, was a couple of things. Another prelude here, even though this is about, we're gonna focus on Hydrashare and the Jupyter Hub. Um, in reality, you're gonna, uh, we end up using GitHub. There's really no, it's the best way to, um, there are, you're definitely gonna end up using GitHub. So as an example, I just wanted to show that this, here, I'm gonna do one thing here. So I'm going to use the Slack channel and just put these resources in here. So in the help desk is an, uh, a link to the article so you can open it in your browser yourself if you like. And then the other resource that we have for you here is the GitHub repository organization. So our Water Hack Week, we have our own organization. Um, and this is an example of a small or a, what a new organization in GitHub might look like. And then it has our repository from our paper. So um, Jezra, um, and part of her professional role and part of her professional training is to um, sort of initiate this component of governing tribal resources in her professional position as a scientist with the tribe. So this paper and this GitHub repository is the code and the data in one version, but it also goes through and has the abstract and it lists um, the citations which um, bring us to Hydrashare. So the data resource here um, is the Hydrashare resource that has our um, lapse rate study data. So that's the third resource I will put into the help desk um, hyperlink there. So, and then you'll see how one way we use the land acknowledgement that's specific to this location is we included it here with the citations for code, data, and the journal publication. Okay, so then from GitHub, this is really the avenue that we designed that people would get into HydraShare as a, a new user or someone who wants to access the data, assuming they are not, um, you know, coming in already from HydraShare. So how I use HydraShare, um, is or as a new user to Hydrashare, what you're going to need to do for this week is to come to Hydrashare.org and sign in. And then, um, so that's sort of like another entryway to to using Hydrashare. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Uh, then the resource that we put together for the publication then is um, specific to so this is what a, an example of what a fully populated resource might look like one reason um, that i want to highlight for your, making your data accessible in this way is that you can track how many views have people, how many people have viewed the data set how many people have downloaded the data set um, and then you can track information and provide information easily about how to cite the resource. Sometimes miscommunications happen in science where people use your data or use your research or use your open source software and you haven't provided the information about how to cite your work. So even though you want to make it publicly available, um, sometimes it's hard to know how to cite it. So this really takes the um, that extra step of figuring that out away because as you, um, I'm just gonna go to the citable components here at the bottom, it just 
shows, um, for example, the how to cite output of this is a function of all of the other inputs to the resource. So as a quick, that was a, a big scroll through, but I think everyone has access to it if you want to look at it at your own speed um, at another time. I personally like to start at the bottom of the resource um, and I will think about how to um, cite the resource um, is also a function of how do you, what are the licenses? Is it an open source license? Is it a Creative Commons license? Is it managed by a data agreement? Um, those are all things to think about. Uh, you can list contributors. So if it's hyperlinked, these contributors are already HydraShare users, so it's easy to add them in and connect them with their own profiles so that they are, um, you know, the folks who are listed in your article are also listed in the HydraShare resources contributors. And the credits and whatever you present in your acknowledgements, that it can be machine readable and trackable using this metadata. So we really we're not trying to, it's a, it's a great way to just put everything that you've already got in your acknowledgements or in your paper um, in a computer readable format by using the structure that the HydraShare development team has put together for us. So um, let's see, related resources, um, one and the, the sources of the data, when you, one aspect of working with HydraShare that um, is a vision that I think is really a, it's a work in progress to understand how really to make this vision happen, specifically to um, the sources and why we were able to put this resource together with so many related resources. Jeff, and I know David, and I know um, Claire, and there's related resources because we know the humans behind all of these sources, and we can have conversations with them on GitHub or email or Slack and have make those connections before we make the computer connection. Um, and so this related resources and how you reference your, the work um, this is one thing we want to experiment with. How do we how do we do this with Water Hack Week? If we build on um, this really great Binder app that Scott's going to show us, and you use that for a project that he never could have imagined it could be used for, and you had no idea that you could show your data in this way, um, how do we connect the resources and acknowledge um, how to work together online using the metadata here? This may or may not be exactly, you know, it's a work in progress. It's constantly being developed and improved. So let's Keep improving it here. Um, then there's a new feature in the resource structure is the README. So one way that I try to use the README is I copy the README from GitHub. So whatever is the GitHub README, then I, I post that. Then um, the, the heart of this, of course, is the files. And so you can see here, I've got folders of GIS data, I've got time series data, I have a CSV of elevation, and then these orange friends are the notebooks. So these notebooks are, um, from there we're gonna, we can go to the Jupyter Hub from there and other steps that, we'll, that Tony will cover. Um, then other tools that connect each other, space, time, keywords, all of these are computer readable friendly ways to make sure we can find the data. So when I put in the information like spatial resource or where in the Pacific Northwest is this location and what is the timestamp of when we collected data there, then, and that's made publicly available. So here is my when it's made publicly available, when you go to the Discover tab, this is for all public resources. And I can, anyone can search for resources that are, have anything to do with the nook stack or temperature or whatever it is that you're, you're looking for. So I'm gonna pause again here for, um, for any other questions about 
how to use HydroShare, why we use HydroShare. Christina, could you maybe yeah. explain what the README file is to everyone, please? Like a little bit more, just in case it's sure. not clear. Sure. Um, so there are other ways people could put README files together. So I can explain how I use README files. Um, so in GitHub, when when it's usually a repository in GitHub, it's gonna you know it looks something like the HydroShare repository. It's just a different structure of how the folders and um, the formats of the data files are are held. And so a readme.mv is a markdown file that is a description of whatever is in that repository. So how I build readmes is I usually try to include this, um, a, a DOI of uh, the, the GitHub repository and all of the code, um, and then the abstract that is really a copy and paste of the journal article, and then describe the other connections and locations and provide all the hyperlinks to where the data and code and paper live. But this readme is, is used to have I use the readme as an avenue to be able to look at the code. So when I copy and paste that into my HydroShare resource, the HydroShare resource is my location of all of the data. So why do I need to have this in two places? Well, GitHub is great for tracking code and HydroShare, um, however, GitHub has this limit on size. So my data set is too big to store on, on GitHub and HydroShare has enough size and storage. You can you know, ask, request more storage. We can negotiate how to um, set up the metadata in a way that really captures all of the things we need to think about when we're building hydrology models. So I use the README to capture all the information about the code in this data resource on HydroShare. So I'm going to um, wait for more questions. Um, and we, I think most people have looked at the groups. Oh, Amelia um, says I have the smallest data. Go ahead. I had a question. Yes. Um, so when you were okay. back on the, the page of metadata, so you immediately said, oh, like this page, yes, perfectly, o -M -O -D -M -I. to you that I think means time series. When I looked at the um, readme file, I didn't see that uh, defined. So for someone coming from the outside, a non-engineer, that would not necessarily be intuitive to me. I know GIS, but is that intuitive to everyone? already because I didn't see it defined in the readme file. And I'm sure there's other examples. There are other examples. There are examples of this every day in my life. Yes, my work life is made up of these examples. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it really means this multidisciplinary aspect for this. It's really complicated, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So can I just yeah, because, chime in real quick, Christina? Ahead. So something to, what Christina is showing here is um, is just a user generated. It's all their content. It's a web page generated by a user to display their data, the meta, their, the the metadata of their data, um, and it can be as thorough or as incomplete um, as the owner wants it to be. So these are common problems. You know, using language like um, you know ODM two which is a particular schema for storing time series and other observation data. Yes, it, you know, it may or may not make sense to some people, but um, the truth is she's actually showing a very thorough, um, thoroughly populated um, resource. So there is this limitation of, or this shortcoming that, you know, the, the content that you find in HydroShare is only as good as the, is what the user supplies and the metadata that the user supplies. So there is a, a, a range from low quality to high quality data sets um, that 
is something that's just kind of inevitable with the way that HydroShare works. Well, and I think that the, you know, as a meta commentary, at Water Hack Week, we want to figure, like identify those issues and, and fix them because it is, a, it is actually a struggle every day of my work life is something to do with what you brought up, Elaine. So as, a, as one structure for Water Hack Week, um, we added, you know, vocabulary, platforms, software libraries, tools and methods, what are these acronyms, you know, and so this is not a, this is not a thorough enough list of, of learning resources. So if I add in ODM1 or ODM2, like what are the, what are the things that come up throughout the week that are, don't make no sense to someone from a different domain? And I've never even had the thought before that that was something to think about, right? Without our hack week, I wouldn't have known, even though I work with Elaine all the time, you know, <laughs> how, what the heck is ODM1, right? So yeah, the, yeah. The, the process this week is when you find these, um, when you come across that thing, it's gold, right? Because it's the thing that's gonna make the connection. It's gonna be, that's the moment where interoperability gets made. Mm -hmm. So the how to, how to edit this um, is a, something we'll, we can talk about with Emilio and, and contributing on GitHub, um, but right. that's, Thank you for that's making my, my uh, very basic questions sound actually useful. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great example. Um, <clears throat> Tony, I was going to give an intro to the Water Hack Week groups, or we could take it back to the, your, you could go through the rest of some of your slides next, and then I can do groups if you want. Yeah, um, Christina, do you mind if I take that back for a minute? Um, so, Christina gave a good overview of how you might use HydroShare in the real world. And just, you guys can see the slides again, correct? We are gonna cover some of the, um, a little bit more detail on some of the things that Christina um, has shown in this HydroShare resource that she was looking at. Um, and it may be a little bit, you know, for people that are familiar with HydroShare, this might be a little bit basic, but I, I just, the, pur the purpose here is to give an introduction and also to get everybody on the, on the same page here. So like I was saying before, go to HydroShare.org and sign up for an account if you haven't done so already. Um, you will get an email and you'll have to go to your email, click this link to verify your account, and then you'll have a working account. The very first thing that you should be doing when you log into your account in HydroShare is going to your profile and putting in as much information about who you are and your research interests and, and such um, as possible. This helps, um, this helps quasi report to NSF about our community and who's using our system, but also helps improve the collaboration aspects of um, helps you better use the collaboration aspects of HydroShare because people will actually be able to understand who you are um, when they find your data sets. So, um, like I said, we're going to cover a little bit of, of, of the stuff that maybe um, that, that you were just exposed to with, with Christina's demo there. Um, but before we get started, HydroShare, um, like I mentioned earlier, this is an NSF funded project. It's gone through two rounds of funding and multiple supplements. Um, a lot of those codes are at the top right corner. Um, it's a very large and diver diverse group of um, water scientists and computer scientists, um, and it is operated by Quasi. Um, so it was originally a research project. It's now um, operated um, by Quasi. Um, some of the key attributes or key um, aspects of HydroShare is open data, transparent data, research reproducibility, collaboration, uh, and building trust around um, research and research findings. Um, and I, we'll talk a little bit about how we do that. But so this is the, um, what I was mentioning about your, your profile page. Um, this is some information about my profile. I have a photo. I have information about who I am, subject areas. These are actually very useful for when people find your data and they wanna know, oh, is this person a hydrologist or, or something else or a geographer or whatnot. Um, you can also link in your, uh, Orc IDs, Google Scholar, uh, ResearchGate, I believe you can put Twitter and stuff like that. So anything that you want to, to kind of link together some of these uh, so 
social uh, scientific networks. Um, and then a HydroShare resource. So we looked at an example of a HydroShare resource um, that Christina was using or has had created to publish some research findings. Um, but the way that HydroShare is structured, in ge generally speaking, is that you'll be creating data, you'll create data locally, you'll upload it to HydroShare, describe it with metadata, share it with colleagues, and then the fifth step, which actually isn't shown here because it's an old screenshot, is to publish it and get a, a formally publishing a digital, get a digital object identifier. Um, for a digital object identifier is the same sort of thing that you get when you publish your research paper in a journal. And it is a persistent identifier that will direct anybody. It's a hyperlink when you click on it, it will direct them to the data set or your, your resource in HydroShare. And what we'll talk about in a little while is why you might want to do that with your data in HydroShare. Um, and spoiler, it's so that when people find your research publication, they can find the data that you used in your publication. So it's, um, it's about disseminating your research, but also providing um, fair um, or meeting fair principles and, and you know, reproducible and replicable science. So once you've logged in, there's a few um, things that you can do in HydroShare. The My Resources um, window shown in the top right corner shows all of the data sets that you've created and uploaded to HydroShare, as well as ones that have been shared with you. Um, so every resource uh, has access and control associated with it. So you can create something that's completely private to just yourself or private between you and a, a set of colleagues that are working on it. Um, you can also make it completely public. And um, by default, anything you create is going to be private initially. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, it just shows an image of the content or the data associated with one of these resources in the top right corner. So like, like Christina showed, you, you can have things like ex this, this one on here has CSV files, and it has something, oh, a docx. So it has CSV, Excel, and Word documents. Um, Christina's had uh, some code. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, why that might be useful. But generally, a HydroShare resource is, is what we call a, uh, a set of data that's been uploaded to HydroShare and metadata that's been added to it. Then we call it a, a resource. Um, the things, a couple pieces of metadata that you might want to look out for, the title. Titles can be anything from my test data set, which is very uninformative, to a very structured um, titles that follow a specific pattern. And this is um, an example from a critical zone observatory um, where all the critical zone observatories have agreed to follow a similar naming convention for all of the data sets so that when you, when you look at all of them on a list, you can identify uh, various, uh, various things about them just from their title. That's why this one is very long. Uh, but you have this title, you have authors and owners. So you may have one or more owners, but the owners are not, not just because you're an author doesn't necessarily make you an owner. Um, you, this particular resource has a digital object identifier. This is something you actually have to request. There's a button to say, hey, I have my resource. I want to make it published now and get my digital object identifier. It will go through a completeness review process, meaning um, we're going to look for make sure that it meets all the you know very basic requirements of, of a published data set um, like no typos the data makes sense things like that um, it's not doing a peer review that's very important um, and the peer review is saved more for when this is published and linked to something in a journal article that's where the uh, peer review can kind of look closer at your data and make sure it makes sense but um, quasi is not it's not doing that um, Resources also have spatial and temporal metadata. They may or may not have spatial and temporal metadata that helps out with searching. Um, on the, the right-hand side, we can have the right the image on the right-hand side, you can have resources that are derived from other resources. So you can kind of link and say, oh, this work continues the work of the, the thing that's been published here. Um, you can also cite all your funding agencies. Everything that, every resource that's created in HydroShare is given a URL or a, I'm sorry, a citation. If you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner. And that citation um, exists whether, whether or not it's been published. If it's been published, that citation will contain the DOI. Um, and if it's not, it'll simply contain a link to this resource. However, um, you can 
resources can be edited and deleted at any time. So really you only want to reference things that have been formally published and when they become formally published they're immutable. We can talk more about that. In fact, if you're interested in publishing data in HydroShare or at the end of the Water Hack Week, in, interested in publishing your findings, John Pollock is the right is definitely the person to talk to. Now, I'm only showing some of the metadata here. Christina went into much more, went much further in depth in the different types of metadata you may have. She talked about um, README files, um, or README files, any text file that you, or markdown file that you upload to your resource, it'll render it in the page. Um, she talked about uh, licensing and all that kind of stuff, but we're not going to get into it. Oops. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about are resources. So we have the resources in the top left, a resource, um, you know, is content plus metadata. Um, but then we also have groups and communities. So there's are the three major um, concepts in, in HydroShare, resources, groups, and communities. Um, so if the resource is essentially a data set, um, groups on the top right corner, like the Water Hack Week group, is a, um, is a collection of people who create data and share data within the group. So you can share things privately only within people that are in your particular group. So the Water Hack Week um, group, you have to request to join, which um, if you have a HydroShare account, I encourage you to go to Water Hack Week, or I'm sorry, go to the Collaborate tab on HydroShare, find Water Hack Week and request to join. Um, and then you can also have communities, which we won't get into as much because there's actually one community right now, and that's for the Critical Zone Observatories, which are uh, a community is a group of groups. So um, it's really just a, a structure for, for um, sharing and, and curating data sets. Um, there's two groups that you're going to want to be a member of. One is the Water Hack Week, and the other one is the Quasi Jupiter Hub. Um, and real quickly, just to talk a little bit about the general process for HydroShare. Um, the, the, the process for publishing your data sets. Um, this is a slide from Jeff Horsborough, and this is a, something that actually happened. So they like to use as an example, but it's very, something very common. Um, you have uh, a few people that are working on a project together and they have a new study idea. They collect a whole bunch of data over several months. They, one of the people on the team uploads it to HydroShare. Um, other, someone else on the team downloads it, writes some MATLAB code. Um, and you know, updates the code on HydroShare, updates the code and data on HydroShare. So basically at this point, you have some sort of data sets that is shared privately between a few uh, team members or research group members. Um, you write your paper, you submit it for publication. You, and at that point, you wanna reference your data set. Um, and then your reviews come back and you have to revise the paper, update the code, update the data. Um, and then generally you resubmit. In this case, um, one of the team members had a baby. So that person was, um, was busy with, with life and um, other people on the team, since it was all shared in a, all the data and code um, are shared in a central location, um, other people are able to continue the, um, the work like the MATLAB code, um, resubmit the paper. And then finally, you're able to publish, simultaneously publish your data set and your paper. So you have these two um, permanent links between, um, between uh, well, your journal publication and your data. Um, yeah, so that's the end goal, and that's the, the workflow that I really, really briefly described in the very first slide. Um, so what I wanna do before we go too much further, um, so that, that's, I guess, just the overview of HydroShare, um, and I wanna, I'm kinda speeding through this because I wanna leave some time for us to do some demos on both of these um, things a little bit more and also play around, but, um, one of the things that HydroShare has been designed to support are um, it was designed for you to support users that want to extend the capabilities of HydroShare through web applications. So these are third-party um, pieces of software that are linked to HydroShare um, through an API, an application programming interface. Um, and, and what this allows you to do is extend the capabilities. For instance, you want to provide visualization or analysis or other types of discovery interfaces, um, and you want to host it on your own, but you want to link it to HydroShare, you, you can actually do that. Um, the key thing here is they're separated. They're completely separate from HydroShare. They're maintained by different people, um, and they can uh, be developed by anyone in the community. And 
the way that they're linked to HydroShare, like I said, it's through um, application programming interface, but um, also using this web application or web app connector resource type. So it's a very special type of, um, of resource or resource again is data plus metadata. This one is actually just a whole bunch of metadata that tells HydroShare how to interact with your resource. So there's a, a, a bunch of these different apps that um, all users have access to and you can click on the apps button at the top of the HydroShare screen to see them. Um, there are other privately um, shared like shared apps. So like the HydroShare app is just a resource. You can have this um, shared privately. Um, but the, all the public ones that are um, approved by Quasi are on the apps page. And that you can get an idea of um, what's there, uh, that screenshot on the top right here. So I'm going to talk just about JupyterHub. Um, JupyterHub is, like I mentioned earlier, um, we are not developers of Jupyter or the Jupyter Hub software. We are users of it. Um, we maintain our own cluster in the Google Cloud to support education and general purpose community research. Um, this is a this is freely this is available free to the water science community. The one thing that you have to do is request access to the Quasi Jupyter Hub group. Once you have access to that um, or once you've joined that group, you'll have access. Um, just to give you a general idea of the the pattern here is the top left corner, the screenshot in the top left corner is data sets associated with the HydroShare resource. So this is the content. So we're not looking at the metadata, we're just looking at the content. Um, on every resource landing page, there is a button called Open With, and that allows you to launch your data into these third-party web applications. So if I navigate to a resource, in this case, we have some uh, Jupyter Notebook and a bunch of uh, GeoTIFFs, and I select Open With Jupyter Hub. Um, what will happen is all this data is launched into a into the cloud, into your own isolated computing environment, where you can execute all the cells. In this case, we're doing some geoprocessing, um, and then there's also code to save your results back to HydroShare, um, and then you could potentially publish this with a DOI. So you could have so this extends the uh, data publication workflow to also publish your um, your code. So now you can have your data and your code published in HydroShare and linked with your journal article, providing a way for um, other uh, reviewers or other scientists to find your work and actually be able to replicate it um, on the data sets that you have. And also raises that barrier, making sure that um, you know people are publishing um, science in a reproducible manner. Now there's a lot of interesting questions around the reproducibility of, of data hosted in this way and that's something we can talk about in the future and, and Christina had mentioned um, Binder and that's a technology I'm not going to talk about right now but that's one way to um, make things uh, more reproducible. So um, a little bit of examples of how this has been used in the past. Um, so we've used this to uh, to do some analysis of continental scale uh, hydrologic modeling. So we have these this, this data set that's created multiple times a day, and actually there's a handful of data sets created multiple times a day, and we wanna look at um, stream flow um, observed versus predicted stream flow at a particular river. So we have some notebooks and we've, we've done that. And last year we actually, the bottom picture, bottom right picture is from Water Hack Week last year. Um, but we've, we've used this particular example a couple different times to show the um, what you can do in this online computing environment. So there is a resource, if you are really interested, um, that will take you through the process of selecting data, domain data for a particular area of the United States, collecting uh, forcing data using a satellite product called NLDAS, and then running a, a model, this particular model called Work Hydro. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is, and I, I've alluded to this already, is the reproducibility aspect of all of this work. So if you if you have your data and your um, code or your workflow published in HydroShare, and that's also linked to your paper, your manuscript published in um, in a journal article, then everybody should be happy because they find your work and they can they can run your code. And this is an example of um, how this has actually been done. Uh, 
This is a paper by, that was um, led by Christina. And we have a variety of HydroShare resources. And you can see that some of them are embedded directly as links in the text. Um, but they can also be referenced in, um, they can be provided as references in the text. Um, but you can also, from your data set, reference your paper, which is shown down there at the bottom. So what I want to do is I wanted to leave enough time so we can actually get hands on. Um, so I would like to, Christina, do you have anything to add? You're, you're muted. Okay, I'm here. Yes, I did lose audio temporarily. Um, but I was going to add is a public service announcement. If <laughs> I have two public service announcements. One is if you lose your connection or anything like that, you can get back by um, using the, the help, the red help button for Zoom. And um, before we move on to how we're gonna, what we propose as our break, next breakout session, I wanted to um, just let people know how, where everyone is so that you can go wherever you want, any, any way that you want to get there. So public service announcement here, you should be able to see my screen where I am on Kiko chat. And you'll see the notes are empty, that's fine. But this red help button here, if you pop this one up and down, you'll see um, links to click here if you need to join by your cell phone. Sometimes you have to turn the, the angle of the phone to be able to be able to click here to get into that room. Um, or you can join the room by phone and just go old school, dial it in on a landline or your cell phone and then just watch from a computer if you need to do something like that. So that's how I navigate around when I get, I have if you have multiple bits of technology cobbled together, that's uh, something to think about. So everyone knows that. And then what I was, um, Tony, do you, let's see the slides that talk about what we're gonna do next. Well, Christine, I was gonna uh, go into, uh, into a demo on Jupyter Hub. If okay, you don't have else to add. so do you want everyone to follow this demo? This is the activity here. That I'm sharing. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go nice and slow, and they can follow. I'll, I'll ask everyone to follow if they if they feel comfortable. Otherwise, we can, you know, we don't have to. Um, sure. Just as a time for time planning, I think um, we'll have like, let's. I would propose 15 minutes of going through your demo, so you can we can watch you go through these steps, um, and then and the demo with the Jupiter Hub, and then we can do a breakout. For, um, for people just to see where you're at on making what you see, what, to, what you see Tony do, depending on what level you're at, if um, you're familiar with it or it's totally new, we can break out and address whatever next steps everyone needs in different groups and then um, sort of meet back up before we break for lunch. All right, thanks, Christina. Um, so I, I do have a, a question here in, in the chat from Emilio um, that may be clarifying the, the place for HydroShare, um, JupyterHub, and GitHub, and whether we need all of them or just some of them. I think uh, that's a really good question. Um, and we, we, I've talked real briefly about how HydroShare can be used to collaborate around data sets. Um, when you're collaborating around code, it's a little bit more complicated. You might want to um, uh, be able to track individual individual changes to lines of code. So those of you that are familiar with um, source code repositories like GitHub, there's certainly a place there. And I think um, we'll get into that a little bit more, um, I believe later today, maybe tomorrow, about how, how we should be using GitHub for our Water Hack Week projects. So for a, um, kind of a real-time iteration collaboration on code, we're at 100% going to want to use GitHub, and we will not want to use HydroShare for that. Um, and when it's time to maybe publish your, your final product, or at the end of the day, if you want to update the code, or periodically update it, on, or your, your data or code on HydroShare, that would be the time to do it, but not in a very rapid, um, rapid form. So, um, 
So there's a place we will be using HydroShare, JupyterHub, and, um, and GitHub this week. So if, if you want to follow along, there's a couple things I want to, you know, I'll, I'll try to go slow enough that everybody can, but we don't want to spend too much time. So if you log into HydroShare, your screen might look something like this. Uh, I have, this is, we call it the dashboard view. I have a few resources that I've been playing around with, so they are shown um, right here at the top. You may not see those if you've never created any data. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is go to Collaborate, and I'm going to click on Groups. And remember, I, I mentioned that we want to join two groups. One is the Water Hack Week group, and the other is the Quasi Jupiter Hub group. So what we'll do is just type in um, Water Hack Week. And did it not search? Oh, it might be. Yeah, there you go. Water Hack Week. Um, and this is what it looks like. What mine says you have already joined this group, but if you are not a member of this group, it should have a button say that says ask to join. Go ahead and click on that. And then the second one we want to do is called the Quasi Jupiter Hub. So if we type in oop, Quasi, well, let's Quasi Jupiter Hub. Same thing. We'll have this, this group called Quasi Jupiter Hub, and you'll have to click um, ask to join and then you'll be admitted. Now, the reason you have to join the Quasi Jupyter Hub is because you actually have to be a member of this group in order to access the compute resources. And we do this for a couple different reasons. One of them is so that we under, we have a good idea of who's using the platform so we can tell NSF and other um, stakeholders how it's being used. Um, but the other one is so that we uh, limit the, the number of people that may abuse the system. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is go to the Discover tab at the top. So the Discover is, this is our search interface, and I am going to type, I'm going to search for a data set that I've already created. And we will type in um, fever divide air temperature and dash demo. You don't actually have to have that dash demo, but that's the one we're going to want. A few resources might come up if you just type in beaver divide. Um, but what we want is beaver divide air temperature demo. So uh, this is the data set that I, that was given to me by, um, I believe, Jeff, Jeff Horsborough in, at Utah State University. This is one of his uh, monitoring sites of the, what they call the gamut network, um, which is, oh goodness, um, gradient something, other. I can't remember exactly what it stands for, um, but this was a large NS, oh here, it's gradients along mountain to urban transitions. So there's a variety of sensors uh, or observation sites. And in the Beaver Divide um, observation site, we have some air temperature data. So if we look at the data that's actually in here, we have a Beaver Divide temp.csv, and we have something that I created called simpleanalysis.ipymv. So simple analysis is a very, very simple data analysis just to show how someone might launch from HydroShare into the Jupyter Hub and do something. So what I'm going to do is go ahead up, up top here and click on that open with menu. And you'll see a variety of, of web apps, um, web applications that you can launch. Now you won't see the same list that I have. Like I said, there's several, there's a, a small handful of approved web applications. Those are the ones that would show here if they if 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 they would support the data set that you're currently on. For instance, if if your web application only only works on GeoTIFFs, then it's only going to show up where there's GeoTIFFs in the resource. So um, I have some private things for testing and development, which you would not see. Um, but let's go ahead and click on one that's called Quasi Jupyter Hub. And this is going to redirect me to the Quasi Jupyter Hub compute platform. Um, here we're given an option of what type of environment we want to run with or we want to start. And the difference between these different or these environments are, are really the software that's included in them. We've created one specifically for Water Hack Week. So for, for now, we can talk about this in a breakout, but for now, let's just go ahead and click on the Water Hack Week 2020 uh, environment and say start. Now what's happening is I'm getting my own, my own um, compute space is being provisioned on the cloud. Um, inside there, I'm gonna have persistent data. So anything that I create is gonna stay there. 
we do have a, a limit on the amount of data that we can store at any, any one time. That's five gigabytes. So if there's any projects um, that will be using more data, please talk to me and we can adjust that as necessary. But this also means that when I leave and I come back after lunch, any data that I created will still exist there, which is really nice. Um, so what happened is we have our own isolated environment. Again, isolated meaning no one else is in my compute space. I can do whatever I want. No one's messing with um, the, the objects I have in memory. Um, and then right after that uh, was created, the data um, from Beaver Divide Air Temp um, was copied over. And that's why I have the data right here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this notebook. So we'll load the notebook. And we'll execute this. So this is a very basic time series analysis. Import some libraries. I'm going to read, read the CSV file and print the first 10 lines of it. So that's what the CSV file looks like. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and load that into uh, a pandas data frame, which is something that some of you may be familiar with, but um, it's a very useful library for doing data analysis looks very similar. I can take a look to see if I have um, some no data values. In this case, I do. In fact, I know that I have some values that are very negative, uh, very large, very small numbers in degrees Celsius that I want to actually ignore for this. Um, calculate min, max, and average daily temperatures. Um, and I can create some plots. All right, so min, max, average daily temperatures. There we go. We can also do that in terms of weeks and whatever, but that gets more into the capabilities of the Pandas library. Um, and then I can write these to uh, one single CSV file. And then the, the nice thing here, um, well, I guess we can come over to the contents. We see that we have this min, max, and average.csv file. If we open this, we should have a whole bunch of data in here. Um, so I had this initial data set and I created a, I did some very, very basic analysis, created a new data set. And now I can save that data set back to HydraShare if I want. So here I'm calling it daily aggregate temperature for Beaver Divide. Um, and I'll even call it demo. I can provide an abstract, I have a typo in the keywords, temperature, the files I want to save, and then I can run this, um, this command. There's this library called HS tools, which again, we can talk about in the breakout section session. Um, and there's some documentation online that I'll point everyone to, um, which will create a new HydraShare resource. So we're creating the resource and then we'll go through adding each of the individual files. Each of the individual files and then um, we're given a link. And that link is the new data set that we just created. So I'm seeing some, some, some chat saying that it's taking a little bit of time for your Jupyter Hub environment to load. That can be the case when everybody accesses at the same time. So new virtual machines have to be provisioned. It has to scale up. Um, so just be patient. Um, if we do take a little bit of, if it takes a little bit more time, I will do a little debugging with you guys if it never ends up loading. The environment that you want. So, if, if any, by any, at any point, if you want to change the environment that you're in, um, what you can do is click on your control panel and say "Stop my server," and that will take you back to the beginning. And for fill up, the server option that you want to choose is called Water Hack Week. So, something else I'm going to point out real briefly before we end this for the day. Um, or in this kind of presentation, is there? There's a couple different views you can look at. This one it happens to be the um, the the default view when you launch data from HydraShare. It's called, I think, the tree view or notebook view. Um, if we delete everything after the uh, after dot the dot org and just hit enter, um, it's going to go into a different view called lab. This is a a, a much nicer. Um, more feature rich view of your, your data and notebooks. Um, and we can see it even remembers where you were when you, when you were last here. 
So this is what it might look like. Something, a couple other things to point out, which we can talk about in breakouts, is you can create your own Anaconda environments in here. So each project, you may want to have your own Anaconda environment. Um, so everybody has their own, they can install packages as necessary. That environment persists. So next time you come in, you don't have to recreate it. It just exists. Um, accessing your data through GitHub. So like I mentioned, your source code that you're actively working on as, as a member of your, your team, it's going to exist in GitHub. Um, and we have uh, commands, or we have, I'm sorry, the Git library or software installed. So you can go ahead and run a variety of Git commands here just to clone and um, commit, push your data back and forth so you can synchronize between members of your team. And we'll, we'll talk about that also in breakouts, I believe. So um, if you have any questions about the different libraries and such that are installed, um, you know, any messages to the Jupyter Hub channel or just the general help desk, um, myself or Emilio and Scott can help you out with that. If you have any questions about GitHub and stuff, similarly, um, you can throw that in the help desk and, and in the Jupyter Hub. But with that, I'm gonna, I think we should end this um, example here.